Hello, I'm Maria Hall Brown, and this is LA Currents. Lawyer, counselor, attorney, barrister, defender, solicitor, no matter how you say it, my guest today is actually responsible for the office that has 1,000 of them, 1,000 lawyers to be exact. I'm delighted to be joined today by LA County District Attorney Jackie Lacey. So nice to have you here. It's nice to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to your listeners or your viewers about what's going on in the DA's office. So this DA's office is truly the largest in the country. So given that scope and scale, I mean, what are the fundamental responsibilities of the LA County District Attorney? Well, we're a constitutional office and our job is to prosecute cases that come before us. and. People get a little confused because there are actually 10 city attorneys or nine city attorneys in addition to the DA's office and those city attorneys do the misdemeanors uh, in those areas and we do all of the felonies throughout LA County uh, and uh, we do the misdemeanors in the unincorporated area so we're responsible for a tremendous amount of cases. We, we probably look at 120,000 uh, police reports and review them for filing cases in one year's time. 120,000. Well, I know that as some of the statistics are that 71,000 of those are serious, and then there's, you know, this melee 112 or not, are considered not serious. What's what's the line between serious well, and not serious? Well, uh, yeah. So, um, first of all, it's probably 71,000 that are uh, misdemeanors and the rest are felonies. But when you say serious, uh, felonies are more serious than misdemeanors, right? Based on punishment. Because a misdemeanor, you go to jail. A felony, you go to state prison. And then within that felony category, there are things that are on the lower end of spectrum, such as drug crimes, but then on the higher end are murder, rape, uh, child molestation. Those, as defined by the penal code, are serious and violent uh, felonies. And so our, our, our office, uh, people don't realize just how much um, crime occurs out there. We're pretty uh, insulated from that and how many cases actually come in and what our prosecutor does and the decisions we have to make a lot of times under a deadline in order to figure out are these cases filed or not. This is a little bit getting into the weeds, but you did mention the city attorney. So are there cooperative efforts between, say, an L.A. city district attorney case and L.A. county district attorney case, or do you definitely keep those things separated? And then what about when there are federal issues and what about there are state issues? Yeah. How, how do the different agencies work together in order to combat any kind of criminal it, activity? Right. In some instances, there are written protocols. So, for instance, sometimes uh, a case will be brought to us by the police and we'll look at it and we'll say, it's not a felony, it's a misdemeanor. So then we have an agreement where it goes to the local city attorney if they have jurisdiction. Okay. Other times it could be reversed. They look at it and say, you know what, this is really a felony. It belongs in the DA's office and it should be filed. And sometimes the police officer will make the decision based on pre-established protocols. So we're very cooperative. Same thing with the feds. Oftentimes we'll do something called cross-designation. What that means is I'm loaning uh, lawyers to um, a federal agency to help with a case. And oftentimes you'll see that with organized crime or with gang cases where we might have a certain level of expertise, but the feds are able to get a lot more time and their laws are much more uh, uh, friendly to the prosecution and so we'll loan people back and forth. So we're very cooperative here in LA County. Uh, it is confusing unless you know. Uh, but there are several prosecutorial agencies and we all work together pretty well and talk frequently. Okay, so obviously there's not one element of anyone's life that has not been you know, impacted by this, in, by this pandemic. So obviously in your world, I would imagine there have been a huge you know, domino effect of things that have had to change and had to be adjusted within the district attorney's office for the pandemic. So what have you been able, what are some of the challenges you faced in order to be able to adjust to this? You know, the biggest challenge is we're courtroom people, right? We do a lot of our, our, our work in the courtroom. And the biggest challenge is figuring out um, how to safely advocate in court. Uh, and that's been the biggest challenge. So we have a number of our employees 
that our, our lawyers are able to appear virtually via video, mm -hmm. but it really isn't the same all the time. You know, a lot of times we need a lawyer actually in court advocating or talking uh, to them. Um, one challenge I'm kind of excited about meeting next week, for instance, is we're going to bring jurors in for a really? jury trial. Yeah, next week. Virtually or live? Uh, well, it'll be partially virtual, but there may be a time where jurors are actually in the courtroom and will litigate it as it goes along. So remember, if you've ever done jury service, they bring a big, huge group of people in, right? And um, you can't do that with social distancing. So they'll probably be appearing a shorter, a smaller group of people, probably virtually via Zoom or something like that. But it'll be exciting to see how it goes because, as you know, um, get, just getting jurors to pay attention on Zoom might be difficult. Uh, what about a defendant? Doesn't he have the he or she have the right to have the jurors in the courtroom? And and, and also think about judging a witness's credibility uh, virtually. That may be very different from actually seeing them come in and and live. So it'll be an interesting experiment. But I think the biggest challenge was having us embrace technology um, more so than ever. Uh, out of necessity and really figuring out how to have team meetings or Zoom meetings and uh, do that and be very effective at it. So it's been a bit of a challenge, but we've, I'm so proud of our employees. I'm particularly proud of our IT department. They really have met the challenge. I think like almost 80% uh, of our employees now are, have laptops and can work remotely. So that's been a help. You just made so many question marks fire in my mind when you were talking about, you know, adding a jury because that added, you know, that whole thing of body language and, you know, nuance of, you know, our conversation is substantially different just because we're in the same room than it would be on Zoom, you know, just how I posture my body or what I'm looking at or something like that. In addition to the whole idea of what about you know, referencing briefs and all that kind of thing. I mean, you know, how is all that going to work if you have, a, you know, an attorney sitting there and, and you've got a jury sitting there and you've got a defendant sitting there? I just, I'm fascinated about how this is even mm -hmm. going to be possible. Uh, it'll be challenging. I don't think accessing briefs will be the problem. What I think is going to be the issue is maybe privacy, oh, hackers. Uh, folks seeing things they shouldn't see, even jurors accidentally seeing documents that the court hasn't admitted. I think that'll be the challenge. And think about it. If you're a juror and you're sitting there watching something on a computer and a term comes up you've never heard of before, you might be tempted to start Googling, Googling it and no one's going to know you've done and it. And no one may know you've done it. And so the security part of it and the privacy part of it will be the most interesting thing. And also, you know, the public has the right to have access to a trial. And so even uh, having the court um, figure that piece of it out will be interesting. I know the court is going to be putting in plexiglass because think about, we talked about ju uh, judging the credibility of witnesses. Mm -hmm. Somebody has a mask on, you don't know whether they're smiling or not. Mm -hmm. You don't know what their facial expression is. So. Uh, there'll be plexiglass, there may be even, even be, uh, you know, the full clear mask as opposed to the mask on the face. Uh, there may be people who even just getting into the courtroom will be difficult. There are people for medical reasons who can't wear a mask. There are crowded elevators a lot of times. So it'll, it'll be definitely, um, we'll be venturing into areas that we've never ventured in before. Right. Well, there's a lot of change and a lot of change that is going to be a positive uh, thing for a lot of organizations, departments, industries, et cetera. But I would imagine that there's also a big backlog right now because of the fact that so many things had to be shut down. How is your office managing that? And are you feeling confident that you're able to catch up as time progresses? You know, the backlog is going to be the big issue. Uh, there are people who would have had their trials in March, but because no trials have taken place, uh, they've been waiting, and so we'll be doing their trials first. I think the last number I saw was somewhere in the 1,200 range, that there are 1,200 jury trials still waiting, waiting to be tried. So That sounds like years to me. Well, what we're going to do, and what we started to do, is to really sit down and have discussions with um, defense attorneys about things that we can settle now no. so that there isn't that backlog. So I imagine there'll be 
uh, offers will be adjusted to to really make sure that we are not um, overburdened with a lot of backlog cases. Yeah. Well, that's big picture stuff. So I'd love to hear some things. You know, you've had um, a lot of specific priorities. You know, in your tenures, uh, your two terms. You know your effort to protect seniors, you know, your effort to stop and um, help those who've been trafficked, human trafficked, the unhoused and the mentally ill. How do you feel all of those things that have been projects, initiatives and priorities for you, how do you feel they are right now? Where are they in their standing? I, I think we've made substantial improvements on a number of fronts. For instance, with seniors, um, you know, I got involved in that project because of my mother was scammed uh, by a phone con artist who said, uh, we have your grandson in jail, don't tell anybody, but just wire cash to this particular place. And what did they pick the wrong woman? They picked the wrong family, <laughs> I must tell you, because we all got involved in stopping it. But it got me to thinking that there are a lot of seniors who are falling victims to that. So we have been on a very deliberate, robust campaign to let seniors know via videos and, and pamphlets uh, that, hey, look, uh, be aware of this, that if somebody asks for any personal information, uh, be wary and, and hang up. So we've done that. With human trafficking, I'm most proud of the fact that we stopped really going after the women and the girls who are on the street because, because we started to ask the question, who's making that money? And really we've gone after traffickers in a very uh, robust and, and I think the right, you know, in my opinion, the right way. Uh, some of those traffickers are getting life in prison who are trafficking girls and, and women, and as, as they should, because this is uh, a terrible thing to enslave someone and force them to uh, use their bodies in order for you, for you to benefit. But mental health. Now, um, we're in the process, it's been five years since I published the Blueprint for Change, and we're in the process now looking to see where are those differences? And one report that I, I think would be interesting uh, for our viewers to note is in Los Angeles City. The police department, uh, LAPD, noted that there was a 43% decrease in the use of force against those who have a mental health crisis. That's huge. Uh, that should be on billboards. And much of it has been because we've invested in uh, mental health treatment more, but and we've trained officers in de-escalation. We run our own uh, training academy where we train officers. LAPD has their own, but a lot of officers weren't trained. But I'd love to see those numbers go down further, and that's the work I really want to do, is see if we can uh, further improve this area and get people help, because a lot of the people are being warehoused in the jail and uh, they can, I, I'm, I'm certain that even based on the reports that I've seen, that if we had the right mental health services in place, we just would not need to have these people in jail. And jail really should be reserved for those uh, who are a danger to our society. Your office has kind of promoted the awareness that there are scams specifically related to the pandemic. Yes, yes. So right now the latest scam we've identified is called the contact tracing scam. Uh, if you have been in touch with someone or near someone who has tested positive, you should get a call from the health department and they'll just be advising you and telling you, hey, go get tested. We have information that you were in close contact with someone. But if they start asking for your social security number, if they want a credit card, that's a scam artist and you should hang up. It, doesn't it shouldn't cost you any kind of money or, or require that you provide any personal information that can be compromised in order to do that. So that's the latest scam. And, and, and you know what's sad about this is that it seems like whenever there's some sort of crisis, the crooks are out there thinking of ways where they can they can get your money using yeah. it. So be careful. Uh, you will get a call if you were exposed, and you should answer questions that uh, are not designed, that, that you can tell are not designed to get your personal information. You always be guarded about your personal information, and always check up. Never just answer the phone and start talking to people without verifying who they are. I would wonder, could you actually just say, may I please have your name and number and I will call you back? You could certainly do that. That's a smart way to do it. 
and to call the public health department, the county public health department, or if there's, you're in a city where they have their own, call them first and find out and verify. That's your best protection against scam. Okay. I'm going to go back to training now because uh, you did say that you have the de-escalation training, but you also have a training within your department, which I thought was interesting, especially given the current uh, social unrest and the current issues of racism that need to be addressed, you know, universally. You have bias training. Yeah, yeah. You know, I am the first African American to hold this position, the first woman, and uh, I um, openly talked about race with my family growing up. My parents were from the South, uh, the Jim Crow South, and they openly talked to me about these issues. Uh, it wasn't until I got to be an adult that I realized that not everyone openly talks about race. As a matter of fact, in some households, it's taboo. But in the LA County DA's office, where we're serving a community, which is uh, mostly people of color, we have got to discuss it. We've got to make sure that there aren't policies that discriminate and uh, more importantly, let the public know that we're about uh, seeking justice uh, without regard to people's race or uh, gender or sexual orientation. So uh, I, I was one of the first department heads, I may have been the first to mandate it for everyone in my department. And many people have come to me and said, you know, I was apprehensive about this, but it spurred discussions, it spurred me to, it, encouraged me to talk about something that made me feel uncomfortable, that I would like uh, for um, someone to stop doing in the office or stop saying. So uh, yeah, I, I'm very proud of the fact that our management team embraced it and our folks embraced it. And uh, I think we're a better office because of it. Do you feel the weight of being not just the first woman LADA, but also the first woman of color? I mean, did you, did ever, did it play into your mind as much as it now plays into your uh, bio? Was it ever something that, that really weighed on you or was it just something that ended up being a part of who you are? Well, I never imagined uh, that growing up that I would be a lawyer. Uh, I wanted to be a school teacher. I never imagined that I would be a prosecutor, really didn't know what prosecutors did. And I certainly never imagined that I would lead the largest office in the nation. And when I was running, I simply thought, uh, I'm gonna put forth the, the ideas that I have, and I'm gonna do my best to get elected. But once in, you get a lot of feedback, particularly from girls of color, and you can see it. They're looking at you and you're thinking, okay, you have given me hope. And, and, and there's a responsibility with that. You want to not just be the first uh, person of your race or your, uh, the first woman, you want to be the best, right? And so you want to make sure that you do things for the right reasons, that you never embarrass the office, that you achieve, that you accomplish things. Because you know that there are people who are inspired by watching you, and they may be inspired to also seek to be the first in their field. So it's, a, it's an extra weight, but uh, I, I'm glad to have it. I'm glad to be the one. What did you want to teach? I wanted to teach children in elementary school. Aww. And uh, you know what, that's a much harder job than I have right now. I <laughs> admire all teachers. <laughs> but uh, I did a little bit of uh, volunteer teaching and a little bit of teaching uh, with um, uh, young people at, in a Montessori school when I was going to UC Irvine. And I realized, okay, this is probably not for me. I'm not that good at it, so let me figure out what else I want to do. So I, but I have a lot of respect for teachers. And, you know, growing up in the African-American community where you really didn't, uh, in my, for my parents, you really didn't have a lot of opportunities. A teacher sometimes was the highest educated person in the South in certain communities. So they were looked up to uh, quite a bit. So when I came along, uh, my dad, you know, ever so subtly suggested, hey, look in the teaching. I think that's the way to go. But uh, thank God I found the right place for me. I was born to do this work. I'm a fierce advocate, and uh, I love advocating for justice and what, for what's right. Are you looking for where you can alter, change, enhance, improve, make some 
differences within uh, the DA's office or are you feeling good that the direction that you are in right now just stay the course? You know, I feel that the DA's office has the right priorities. Uh, we have embraced uh, what I would call good reforms, but also kept in mind that we have the public to, to protect. We've kept in mind victims. Sometimes people uh, blindly go after reforms without realizing what impact that has on the safety of the public. But we've been in very involved uh, at the ground level in making those things work and making those challenges work. Uh, that said, I think as a leader, every t if you uh, don't look for ways to improve your office, then you're probably not doing your job. And so I'm constantly challenging my team. How can we do it better? What can we change? What can we do differently? And uh, going forward, I'll be seeking a lot of outside uh, opinions about what the DA's office could do because at times we're many of us like myself have been in the office for 30 years and you'll find that if you don't get outside of that office there's no diversity of thought and when I say diversity I'm not talking about racial diversity but there are other ways that you could look at something uh, that uh, could could be changed I mean for example we um, dismissed 66,000 marijuana convictions when I first joined the office in the 80s if you were caught with any kind of marijuana, it was a mandatory five days in jail, okay? But our society is much more enlightened about the use of uh, marijuana and it became legalized. And I looked around and I thought, wait a minute, you have all these people who are rushing in to become sellers. What about those people who, got, who did the same thing and now, are now saddled with a uh, conviction, right. particularly a felony conviction? Uh, it doesn't seem fair that they would carry those convictions around on their records because they have lives and they're, many of them are trying to do the best that they can to make a living. So that's, that's one example that I think um, people should know about the DA's office. They should also know that we've really looked at bail, at cash bail very closely. The way bail was figured out is a sheet of paper would arrive every January in front of a judge and a DA and a public defender and that's how and those numbers uh, would be set probably by a bail committee and they would differ from county to county what bail would be. The problem is is that a lot of people are poor they can't bail out uh, uh, and they might lose their jobs or what have you but we looked at reform and we supported SB 10 and actually helped draft language that did both that both um, provided some equity for people, but also continue to protect the community. Because what we didn't want was like someone who had just abused their spouse to get out and abuse them again. We wanted to prevent people from getting hurt. So uh, we've really looked at these issues very, very closely and led in a very innovative way. I know your office is now very uh, strongly focused on transparency, and you're actually, you know, putting things out there. You talk about wanting to hear from the public, but you're also sharing with the public, you know, a lot of really important information in terms of uh, reports about uh, police, you know, shootings, et cetera. So I know that you're posting those now so that people can really look for themselves and not just hear it from the wind. Well, one of the things that I've learned is if you don't tell your story, someone else will tell it and they won't get it right. They won't be accurate. So a lot of people hear that, hey, 602 people have been killed by the police since DA Lacey or since I've been uh, DA. Uh, you hear that and it morphs into they've been, people have been shot by the police and nothing has happened. Uh, the truth of the matter is, and the numbers we put out are, are since I've been DA to uh, May of this year, with regard to officer involved shootings, the number is 341. It's 341. So we've decided to really put that out there in a, and those kinds of numbers out there so that the public is informed that they know. Uh, here's what I would say. Don't get your news solely from social media. It used to be uh, a newspaper would not print something unless they had vetted. vetted, had a couple of sources. Nowadays, people are printing things on blogs. People are, are posting things, and they're not accurate. They don't tell the full story. So we in the DA's office, we have a robust communications division, and we're putting more information out there. We're putting reports out there. People should know in every officer-involved shooting decision we make, 
we draft a report, we put it out there, and we want people to go and read for themselves why a case was declined or, uh, more importantly, what a case was about. A lot of the entertainment cases, uh, uh, sex abuse cases, you know, happen here in Los Angeles. And there's obviously the one that took the, the spotlight, Henry Weinstein. That case is also going to be heard in Los Angeles, even though it's already been heard on the East Coast? Yeah, well, Harvey Weinstein, uh, traveled a lot and he, his case really sparked um, the Me Too movement of uh, women or and men coming out who had been sexually assaulted or abused and kept quiet because the money people, and power money and power and they didn't want to come out so uh, once that happened we really began to get a lot of phone calls at the DA's office from victims saying you know what this happened to me I want to report it and uh, so we created, um, you know, a task force to really look at these cases because they are very unique. Uh, oftentimes what you'll see, especially if someone has power over you, they may uh, hurt you and then you go back, you know, and work with them, right? So that seems contrary to what you would think. But um, the experts explain that well. When someone has that much power over you, that can happen. That doesn't mean that you weren't sexually assaulted. What it means is they've got that much power over, over your life. So it exploded, and even now we've filed a number of other cases, and no sooner than those cases were filed, publicity gets out, guess what? More victims come forward. More people call. Uh, there was a guy named Ron Jeremy. Um, and uh, he, once we filed these cases, suddenly a number of people called and said, hey, this happened to me at that exact location and I want to report it. So uh, good for all these victims because it's really hard to come forward. It really is. Uh, you can imagine their credibility is going to get raked over the coals uh, in the sense of they're going to be questioned about a lot of things. But uh, we believe the victims that uh, have come forward to us are telling the truth and we believe they're entitled to justice, so we're gonna go get it for them. We don't have much time left, but in our last few minutes, you know, you do have a really clear perspective over your last two terms of what's happened in Los Angeles. How are we faring in regards to crime? Are we getting a handle on it? Is it, you know, changing direction? Are we a safer, a safer county than we used to be? Well, let's eliminate 2020 for a minute because yeah, 2020 a, is, is such a one-off yeah. time. But prior to that, we were safer. When you think about the way crime was in the 80s, the 90s, the number of homicides, LA County was really a much safer community than ever. Uh, and that's because we really paid attention to our safety. We enacted reasonable reforms and we never forgot that people in LA County want to be safe. I think no matter where you live, whether it's Compton, or Westwood, you should be able to uh, walk out at night and not fear for your safety. Sometimes that isn't always true. And if we're not careful, we will get so comfortable and presume that things are going to be as safe as they were in 2019 forever. Uh, 2020, though, has been unusual. We've seen a rise in July in homicides, both in the county and the city. We've seen a 33% increase in auto thefts and we've got a we understand that 2020 is a one-off situation but you need somebody you first of all uh, you need a a strong public safety minded police force okay but you need you need to make sure that they treat all residents fairly uh, but you do need uh, to ensure that in order to keep these gains that we've made uh, that we have people who are courageous enough to confront crime and uh, do it in a in a fair and just manner. If someone wanted to get information about what is happening in the LA County DA's office or wanted to read some of these reports or newsletters, what's the best way for someone to be able to access this great information? All right. So go to our website. You can just Google now Los Angeles County District Attorney. Go to our website, check in regularly, but also sign up for our week, our monthly newsletter. I said weekly, monthly newsletter, uh, and you'll get the information delivered to your e email box. But there's plenty of information. Look under reports uh, in our office, and you'll be able to see a lot of the great things we do. And look under our press releases. And then we put out more press releases. Uh, now than we ever have and so there's a lot of reports there's also something called a biannual report read those so you'll get a chance to really know your DA's office
Excellent. Well, it's been delightful talking with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, Beth. And that's a wrap on this edition of LA Current.